Hello, everybody. My name is Nick Pond, and I am the artistic director of CAIC and one of the regular hosts of Heard Over the Piano, CAIC's online discussion series. Please let us know if you have any questions for today's guest. If you have them, please put them in the Facebook comment thread, and I will be sure to ask those questions to our guest today. And also, if you have any technical issues, please throw those in the comments and we'll do our best to address those uh, as soon as we can um, and as immediately as we can. This is the magic of Zoom and live things. Today's guest is Brazilian pianist and scholar Ricardo Balestero. He is the Associate Professor of Vocal Repertoire and Collaborative Piano at the University of Sao Paulo and is a frequent recitalist with many instrumentalists and singers such as violinist Ray Chen, former principal oboist of the Chicago Symphony, Alex Klein, and baritone Paolo Schott. Um, Ricardo, if you'd like to join me. Hi. Hello, Nick. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, so this is the good thing about these difficult times. You know, we get to, you know, to be with each other, even, even though we are so distant. I know thank it's, you. it's miraculous. Uh, thank you for yeah. being here and thanks for taking the time and thanks for staying up late. I know that in Brazil, you guys are a couple hours ahead. So. Yeah, but not so bad. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Uh, how are you doing? How are you faring? It's okay. I know. I mean, we've been going through a very hard time and you know, during this uh, difficult health issue that we are going through. Uh, now, actually, things are worse than last year here in Brazil. So. Uh, we have to be even more cautious now than we were before, I guess. And it has been such a long time, but I think that we have still, you know, at least six or seven months ahead of being home and working from here, trying to make some music actually out of, out of this place. We'll <laughs> well, I'm glad you're okay and I'm glad you're hanging in. Yeah. So um, we met at the University of Michigan, where you studied with Martin Katz. You studied in the United States for a long time, right? You were at Westminster Choir College, where you studied with Dalton Baldwin. Um, you know, and yes. then you stayed in the States. I mean, please tell us a little bit about your journey, just some basic information about you. Okay, well, I started playing the piano when I was 13. And a few years after this, when I was 16, I started somehow playing for voice uh, for voice lessons. That was something that happened sort of out of the blue. And I didn't have an, an experience, but I got a chance to work with people uh, in this, uh, with this uh, voice teacher here in Sao Paulo. And then little by little, I started learning, you know, this kind of uh, collaborating type of I understand a little bit of voice, of diction. So I was picking up a lot of things that he was working with singers. And then um, I went to college as a piano major, and I always did chamber music. I always worked with singers, but not so much in college, but outside. And after I finished college, when I was finishing college, and then I got to, I went to the library, and I saw this big catalog of musical America, you know? And there's this huge, huge sections of um, music schools. And I saw that a lot of the schools had something that was called a company. And that was not, you know, a part of our education system here. You know, we could accompany, but nobody taught about, uh, talked about this as, um, as a body of study, you know. Anyway, so then I got to, I got some information from Westminster Choir College and then I applied and then I went to Westminster where I worked with Baldwin and with JJ Pin, you know, who was a very uh, important person in my life. He was, you know, wonderful. He was very, very young, maybe, a, maybe three years only older than I was, probably in, the, in his 20s. But it was really exciting to work with him there. And then I went to Michigan where I I met you too and Shannon. And so since then we've been sort of in touch, not as often as I wanted. You know. Right. So after Michigan, were you you were on faculty at University of Colorado Boulder for a year, right? 
And yes. then you also were in the Houston Grand Opera Studio with me and a yes. bunch of our friends. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, as I spent one year uh, replacing uh, a colleague of mine uh, at uh, University of Colorado, and then I went to Houston State for one year. And then I moved back to Brazil just to stay here for one year, but my life sort of changed so much. And then I decided to stay, which was very nice. I was not sure that was the right decision when I made it, but after what uh, more than 15 years now i i know that was the best decision i've made and i think part of the subject of today's conversation is actually because i came back and i got to know more of nepomoceno songs you know so okay that brings us to today's subject um tell us about alberto nepomuceno and um who he was and when he lived and you know how you well, let's start with who he was and, where, and we'll go and what he did and we'll go from there. Well, Nepomuceno was a composer that lived from 1864 and he died in uh, 1920, actually. Last year was his death centennial, right? Um, so he's sort of the same generation as the BC Strauss, even though they lived, you know, with the different uh, longer or, or shorter periods of time. And um, I think the most important thing of, of talking about Nepomuceno is that we need to know a little bit what was the Eurocentric music in Brazil before that. So we can see, I'm not talking about Brazilian music because this is so plural and so huge, but the Eurocentric music in Brazil in the colonial period is basically church music, right? So after Brazil became independent, and especially after the Portuguese court came to, some, to Rio, that was during the Napoleon invasion of Portugal, the court moved from Portugal to Rio. So Rio was the capital of Portugal and Brazil. This is very unusual for a colony, right? That was a very interesting move from the Portuguese because you, know, you cannot fight with it. <laughs> With, Hard then, to find you know, across the Atlantic. Yeah. And then they were safe here. And because of that, Rio became a cosmopolitan city, which was not before. And that was very important for the city because then you have European institutions that appeared, um, like a fine arts, museums, schools, uh, conservatories, and everything. So in the 19th century, which is pretty much, let's say, from 1820 on, uh, we had a lot of operatic um, activity here. So at one point in Rio, there were as many as 20 opera houses, obviously different sizes, you know, things that today we don't see as professional, but it was a huge activity. So the taste, the musical taste of, 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 of this uh, European people in Brazil, let's put this way, not so much as actually Brazilians, because we didn't have this identity formed, right? Um, it was operatic, like it, uh, Italian opera, right? So Nepomuceno was not oriented towards this kind of uh, music that was very common. He was more interested in what was going on in Germany or in France. And so this is why he left Brazil with the support of the, the second emperor. Um, so it was still a monarchy, Brazil. It was already independent from, from Portugal, it was a monarchy. Even though he was a Republican, he was very progressive thinking, but he got the support and then he went to Italy, uh, Berlin and um, Paris. So, and then how we, how we can see him because everywhere he was, he, uh, adapted or he absorbed some of the information. So I had one professor at the university in Sao Paulo who called, he, uh, he called, who called Nepomuceno a chameleon. And uh, so that was very important for him to be in Europe and then he came back. Now, he absorbed a lot of different statics and techniques that were outside the Brazilian, let's say, uh, panorama back then. I'm talking about European music, of course. And then uh, throughout his life, he was a teacher, he was a professor, he was an organist, uh, organ teacher, 
com uh, counterpoint teacher. He was the director of the National Institute of Music. So he was a very important figure. Now, for some reason, he was uh, silenced after that. Uh, even in Brazil, he's not, he was not well known in Brazil as he could, because there was a, a, a modernist agenda after that, that somehow didn't like his uh, uh, aesthetics because they were super European, you know? So after, after uh, Nepomoceno, you have a lot of um, focus on, especially Villa Lobos, you know? So the big propaganda of the Brazilian state, the Republic was actually the modernism, the nationalism and modernism. And Nepomuceno was not like that, even though he was, he adapt, um, he used some of my, some of more modern techniques, he was not uh, nationalistic. It's so interesting because his Wikipedia page makes it sound like he was very nationalistic. Yes. That's, that's very dangerous it, and uh, because uh, the, the modernist movement told him as the progenitor of the modernism of the nationalistic movement. But if you uh, research all of the, his songs, for example, uh, out of 70 songs, there will be only one that's nationalistic. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So in terms of the nationalism, it seems, I, don't, I mean, this is the thing I'm reading when I was sort of like trying to read up to ask you questions. So I knew what to <laughs> ask. Okay. okay. Um, no, I mean, it's just interesting to me. It seems to me like his focus on nationalism was really based on language. Yeah. Not necessarily musical language, but spoken, like, you know, spoken language and kind of promoting Portuguese as a, an operatic language maybe. Yeah. And also, but not necessarily, I mean, you know, I've, I've become familiar with his songs through your work and mm -hmm. nothing I've ever heard sounds anything like what Villa Lobos was trying to do. No. And it's, um, I don't know, it's such an interesting time in music because so many people are starting to try and establish national musical voices, but mm -hmm. there is this chameleon aspect to what he does. Cause- yes. I mean, we've been sharing, and everybody who's watching, if you haven't had a chance to check this out on our Facebook and Instagram this week, we've been sharing some of the videos you've made, and we'll, we'll probably share another one tomorrow, um, where, I mean, there are songs in Swedish and songs in French and in German. And I mean, the French song sounds like it could have been written by, you know, Debussy or, you know, Foray. Yeah. Like Foray sort of or like, song, yes, yeah. it's like in between, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely distinct, you know, you know, it's not either of them, but at the same time, there's this influence of style there. That's, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, it, the other thing that I find really interesting about his story is, I mean, he was born in Brazil, right? He's not someone mm -hmm. who came over and that, or like came over as a child, like mm -hmm. is a Brazilian citizen from by birth. Yeah. And you have this person who grows up in the Americas, like North and South American continents, you know, in the, in the new world. Mm -hmm. And there's this sense that you have to go to Europe to legitimize your work. I mean, even 150 years ago, which, or, you know, 130 years ago. So, I mean, I find that, I find that so interesting. I mean, yeah. I think back then, at least in Brazil, um, you had to do it. it. It was not, you know, Villa Lobos didn't, you know, he, he was very proud that he didn't study anywhere. And part of the reason that his music is so original, sometimes chaotic, sometimes lacks, you know, technique. Stravinsky used to say that every time that I listen to a music that I don't like, when, and I don't know the composer, sometimes I'm going to look at, and it's Villa Lobos. <laughs> so he was not, you know, uh, appreciated by many of the colleagues, Villa Lobos. But Nepomuceno was different because he was looking for, uh, how to say, structure for uh, education, formal education. And he got that also because he was the son of an organist. So 
as a church musician, you have a different kind of perspective what music can be, right? Right. And so he learned this from his father, and then he went to Europe. And it was, this was very important, Nick, because when he came back, he had uh, a lot of knowledge of how the music, of this, the National Institute of Music could be. And he even brought later on, I'm talking about early 19th century, uh, early 20th century, um, works by Schoenberg, the harmony by Schoenberg he brought. So he was really looking for change, a lot of change. So for me, I think he's sort of, um, his music, his image, his personality was somehow uh, distorted by what came after, after that. So whatever uh, we identify with, let's say, as Brazilian in Villa Lobos music, for example, we try to look back and see, oh, this person maybe did something similar before. But no, I think Nepomuceno was, um, how this can I say, how can I describe this? Nepomuceno was an in-between person, in-between space. He liked this. And many um, Latin American artists of the 19th century occupy this position. They are not particularly uh, identified with a Brazilian agenda. Um, they have some European references, but they're not trying to copy those, you know. So it's something that's not based on a model, a European model, but it's not something that's sort of um, avoiding, you know, this kind of model or a, fighting against this model. Villa Lobos was something that uh, he did this. He was fighting against uh, some models, except for Debussy, you know, or Stravinsky. But everything that was be, uh, European before Debussy and Stravinsky, Villa Lobos didn't like it. It's interesting. I mean, so, and if I remember correctly, Villa Lobos studied with Nepomuceno, yes? At one point? Yes, a little bit, yes. Not so, yeah, it was not like a, a guru or anything, but right. he, there was some part, yes. And he's of this generation that would have studied in the system that Nepomuceno brought back over. So he mm -hmm. could not have avoided this, the touch of the European <laughs> influence. No, of course not. It's, and I don't know, I, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, in a way it's, it's kind of reactive and mm -hmm. I find that just, especially in the context of now in the States, we're having this big debate amongst, you know, there are many music theorists who are arguing that, you know, music theory is racist and because yeah. of the way we look into it and it's, and, and we're kind of, there's a questioning of this sort of, you know, need to legitimize ourselves through European study and looking to Europe and like mastering the European quote unquote canon, you know, and, I don't know. It's 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 interesting to note that it's not just, you know, North Americans who've had this issue with our former colonizers, but <laughs> oh, I think we had a lot too. I mean, and also we have like layers of colonization. You know, uh, you probably are we you are very aware of this. Yes, and uh, it's not only Portugal, but the, all of the influence that come with the, with the Portuguese. The, um, the weight of French culture, you know, within the Western hemisphere, that was huge in Brazil. It's very interesting because the English people had a lot of business in um, Brazil in the 19th century, like they built railways and everything, but they didn't leave a lot of uh, cultural marks. French people, yes, they did. Interesting. So, yeah, so French culture was sort of uh, predominant in Brazilian culture up to I would say the 40s, 1940s. Wow. So if you studied piano, you probably spoke French and everybody did, you know. So, it, so the reaction of the modernists uh, had to be huge, you know. So Villa Lobos had to be Villa Lobos, otherwise he would never really, you know, cross what he wanted, you know. He didn't have, he wouldn't have the power to cross all of this influence to fight against it. So how many, I mean, Nepomuceno was clearly fluent in a lot of languages as well, like you just said. And mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I know he, he, he married, didn't he marry a Norwegian pianist? Yes, he did. He, and, because he met her in Berlin. 
because they were studying piano with the same teacher. And um, actually, they spent, a, a, I think, a few months in Bergen, in Norway. Uh, and then he met Greek. So what we learn in, from the textbooks is that Greek was the person who told him, you know, you have to look for, uh, you have to research your own folk music. You, you, you know, you have to do it. But then uh, recently, musicologists never really found any proof of that. So again, the modernists putting some words into the in people's mouth, you know. So Grieg had to be someone who would say to Nepomuceno, you have to be a nationalist, you know. And he never did, but he was very open to text settings in many languages, partly because he was um, first abroad. And I, I'm sure some of the songs, we didn't have enough information about that, but I'm, I'm sure some of his songs were written as exercise, composition exercise in the early years. But then he also wrote, wrote French songs as late as almost when he died. So he, when he came back to Brazil, he still set a lot of French texts, not German texts, but French, yes. So again, the French stays because it, it was a language that people used to speak it. So people right. who attended the Salon, they, they spoke French. So they were uh, listening to art song back then as people who were fluent in the language. It was not like a foreign language for them, right? I mean, it was foreign, but they knew it. Yeah. Right. It was like a second language as opposed a to- A second language, yeah. yes. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so how many, how many languages did he write in? German, French, Norwegian, Swedish, Portuguese? Portuguese, and then we have some um, uh, religious songs in Latin. Wow, I'm like waiting. So he wrote for he wrote an Angel Misco or Salut Salutaris Ostia, one Ave Maria. Ave Maria is in Portuguese, but Angel Misco Salutaris Ostia, of course, in in Latin. And those uh, religious songs, the sacred songs, you can obviously do also with organ and everything. So the writing is a little different. But all of the other ones are for piano and voice. One of them is with the violin. It's a Dante sonnet that he, yes. And it's um, like sort of a low soprano or mezzo soprano, violin and piano. And is that in Italian? Oh. Yes, in Italian. <laughs> he has two or three Italian songs. That was when he was in Florence. Yes. And then, um, Latin, but he never even touched any text in, let's say, indigenous language. And that was very common for the nationalistic movement to set text in um, Yoruba, for example, later on because of the African uh, religious texts. So after that, the focus was not in other European languages, but languages that were spoken in Brazil. And I was researching these days, still in Brazil, indigenous people speak more than 200 languages. Wow. So, I mean, it's ridiculous because we, we don't know these things. We, don't, we go to school and we just learn Portuguese. We just don't know anything. We know that some words that we speak in Portuguese, so even in English, are of indigenous origin, like tapioca, you know, um, so this is now you go to Whole Foods and you see this because of this globalization, but it's a 2P word, language 2P. Uh, but we don't learn this in school. So we are all totally focused on what comes from Europe. It's really, it's really sad. Now there are a lot of change in indigenous communities that there, there are some laws that require for them to be, to have schooling in Portuguese and in their language. Uh, but it's something that became more of an issue only recently after the 80s, you know, this kind of how we can open up our ears to actually what was, has been here for, for a hundred of years, you know. Centuries. Centuries, yes. It's, um, I, I'm fascinated about his music 
and this story because it's something that I mean, like I said, you know, when you think about being an American singer, for instance, we're expected to master all of these languages. And yet, you know, you go to Germany and I mean, no offense to some of my colleagues, but like you, you know, expect them to even sing in, even in Italian, let alone English or French. It's the expectation is not the same. And mm -hmm. it's, or like an Italian singer trying to sing in English, it's, it's very sweet. <laughs> you know it's but it's the expectation is not the same it's very um it's very interesting to me that this composer encapsulates that experience and kind of holds that tension between east and west mm -hmm. um you know like that it's or whatever old and new is probably what i should say um it's 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 fascinating um so he was a big champion of portuguese is that right he was, and actually we have other examples before. He, you know, people saw the idea that he was the first one, but we have songs uh, sung in Portuguese before Nepomuceno, uh, especially the songs of Carlos Gomes, who was a major operatic composer. He wrote a bunch of songs actually too, I would say 60 at least. I'm not, I'm not good with the numbers, sir. But, um, in French, in, in Italian, in even Venetian dialect, uh, many songs, and in Portuguese too. Some of his songs are written. Now, we need to understand that back then we had already an art song type of, song, of um, composition in Brazil called Modinha, which is pretty much a sort of a European Portuguese kind of romance. It's not so different from the French romance, so the songs that somehow came before the melody, you know. So you have those, you know, simple accompaniments, some nice melodic line, some ornamentation, and sometimes the songs could be either embellished, you know, like a bella canta. Sometimes they would be more like comic. In the same way that maybe you can find, let's say, Papageno type of uh, music within the music out, you know, output, for example. So we have a we had um, with Mojinha a genre that was partly bel canto and partly street based. Let's put it this way. Interesting. So, uh, but Nepomuceno was not looking at Mojingas because Mojingas were like still the classical period and early romanticism, like Donizetti to Rossini type of music. Nepomuceno was interested in what Schubert did, Schumann was doing, uh, maybe Brahms and all of that. So while he was trying to, let's say, absorb this technique, even when he, uh, he had some text in Portuguese, we can see that he was trying to emulate the, uh, the idea of melody or the German lead and everything. And pretty much in the same way that Brahms did. So he was not so much into text, text painting, but the idea of creating a musical, um, a complete musical experience out of the text, you know? Uh, and not so much um, confined, you know, with the framework or the ideas of the text. So Brahms was a major influence even in his Brazilian songs. Now, there is one song of his with te text of Machado de Assis called Sad Heart, Coração Triste. And, you know, I have all the complete works of Machado and I was looking for this. I, for some reason, there's I was having a hard time because I was looking at the poems because it was a poem. And then uh, I didn't find it. And then I said, maybe it's a translation of Machado de Justice. So then I learned that Coração Triste is actually in its origin, a Chinese poem. It was translated into, I don't know, maybe French and then Machado translated into Portuguese. So then with, with this song, we have a Chinese poem translated maybe two times until we get to this. So it's really nice to see how the text evolved, you know, 
and we don't know anything about until we we research backwards, right? Right. It's really interesting. So speaking of research, I mean, what 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 drew you to his music? I mean, was it something that you always knew as you were studying in Brazil, or was it something that you kind of came into after you went home, after your time in the States? Well, when I came back to Brazil in 2004, yes. Well, I had my university search for my position. That was in 2005. And there was this interview. And people could ask anything, whatever they wanted. And one of the professors who were uh, at the, the, search, the search brought me this, which is the complete songs of Nepo Moselo. He gave you? me this. Yes, the, yes. He gave me this, and he opened to a, in a page that was this song called Oração ao Diabo, so prayer to, to the devil. And then he asked me, uh, can you look at the music and can you tell me who you would assign this piece to? Which kind of voice? And would you assign this piece to a, um, a student? It was a very smart question because he wanted to see if I knew vocal writing, if I knew the vocal types, but also how I would deal with a subject that was very delicate, which is your you, you were singing a prayer to devil. So I look at this music, it was written in Portuguese. I never really played this song. It's very good for a baritone, like Iago, you know, it's pretty much like this. He was having this have reference all the time. Nepomuceno knew a lot of music. And it's a very interesting song, very, uh, a lot of, like, very orchestral. You could see that he probably, he was going to orchestrate this music. So then, okay, I got this muse. I mean, I got this score, and I and I did my. I answered what he wanted. I think what he wanted. I'm not sure. And then I went to the bookstore, the university bookstore, because that was published by the university. And I bought the book. And then I went home after a few days, and I started reading the music. As I was like, okay, this is probably not so interesting. I had this kind of prejudice against this music before. And then I was reading, it's like, well, this is wonderful. This is really, there are a lot of wonderful music in this. But I didn't do uh, a lot of his music. I Maybe I've played, a, I would say, six of, the, of those songs in 10 years with Brazilian singers. And I did play uh, this music, some of the German text too here in Brazil. But then I was talking to Kindra, you know, our friend from San Francisco about this composer and she was like interested, but she, she was not believing it could be good, you know? And um, so I said, can, you, can we read through? Do you mind? And then we start reading some of that, like not the Portuguese ones. I said, you know what, you, don't, you, you sing so much in German. There are so many of his German songs, we can do those. But then we wanted to do some French and the Swedish, it's kind of Norwegian, it was kind of in between. And then she loved it. So she became a wonderful partner, you know, to kind of uh, record this kind of this music to perform. Actually, we've done a couple of times in the, U in the US, actually in San Francisco, in the San Francisco area. And we did, I probably, four recitals here in Sao Paulo with his music. And it was really special because, um, it means a lot to Brazilians, you know, someone who come, comes all the way from the States, who memorized this music and, and believes and put, you know, this heart into this. And it was really exciting. And, and then all of these performances served somehow to rehearse for a recording. And I was very happy that we performed first a lot before we recorded. It's always very luxurious to do it that way. Yeah. I, I never ever give myself that chance. And then I'm just stressed out in the recording studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. And I, because I don't live in the States, so we, we didn't have you know a lot of time to do it. So I was very happy that we did this because we had maybe a couple of days to get you know this. But I don't know if it's time to talk about the project, but 
the project that I did with Kendra was not so much on uh, about Nepomuceno as separate identity. What I wanted to do with Nepomuceno is actually to show uh, not the influence, but the relationship relationships that he can make, we can make between his music and Greek, uh, his music and Shoston songs and Strauss. And why is that? Because I think Chausson is probably the closest composer. Uh, because Chausson is kind of, it's French, but not only French. You have some César Franck, you have some uh, Ger Germanic music, some chromaticism. Yeah, no. So you have someone who is a, a French Wagnerian, you know? Yeah, no, he drank that Kool-Aid for sure. Exactly. <laughs> so I think he's probably the closest one, not that they would sound alike, but sometimes they do. Uh, but because the, the place that they occupy is kind of in between space. Anyway, Greek, because he was married to this Norwegian person who met, who knew actually Greek. Uh, and Strauss, when he came to Brazil in 1920, conducting the Berlin Film Harmonic, he conducted one of his works. Interesting. Yes. So that and that was like two weeks before he died. So imagine you have Richard Strauss coming to the Teatro Municipal in Rio in the 20s, and he conducted uh, an overture to one of his, uh, his operas. And then he died. So I wanted to show all of these aspects, not only musical affinities, but more importantly, I think, um, some affection that we can find between these people, you know, some humanity that, uh, some support that one showed to the, to the other, you know, and so it's a little bit like a little Facebook of Nepomuceno, so to speak. Uh, and I really like the program. So we have Nepomuceno, Chausson, and then Strauss, and then we, it's not like separated in block, but in, but it's, it's very fluid. It's really nice. So we're waiting for this to come out, but the recording was done. We have the master, you know, um, files and everything. So I think maybe in a couple of months we'll have a digital release. We'll see. Well, you'll have to keep us posted so we can share it with everybody. People really need to listen to more of this music. Yeah. It's, it's a fascinating, I mean, the, the way we tell our history, it's so limited, world history, you know, especially in, in music history. There's so many people who get sidelined because you think, and this I think speaks a little bit to the prejudice you're talking about that you and Kendra had in encountering mm. it. You know, it's, we think, oh, we know all the greats already. It's these people who everybody told us is great and the ones we study in music history, but music history is much more international and much more diverse than people give it credit for. And just because people were left out on the sidelines doesn't mean that the music they wrote wasn't great. You know, there's, um, I mean, it's amazing. Like you, the program you described really talks about how international the musical scene was 125, 150 years ago, which I don't think people realize how, you know, how much these people were cross pollinating and traveling and, you know, it's yes. Fun. No, we, this is very important, I think, to, we learn, you know, a lot of things. Actually, I think a lot of efforts that we put into our musical education, and, you know, we, we go to school, some people pay a lot of money to go to school, and then you think that this is the whole thing, you know, you know we're, we tend to see that, that that's it. But we don't, we don't know anything, you know, I, I've been researching a lot about, um, Brazilian women composers, you know, and uh, there are a lot of groups of uh, people, researchers who are doing this, and uh, and interestingly enough, we you have sort of a the lack of, of Brazilian black women composers. Interesting. Yeah. So we you get to some uh, um, let's say niche some intersections that you don't find enough information. And of course there are, 
And people who maybe in the history, they didn't tell us they were black, but they, they, they were like Chiquinha Gonzaga, a very famous Brazilian um, composer with a lot of songs, but some of them were like, more like popular songs and piano music like polkas and little sambas and all of that. And a lot of operettas she wrote. And that was in the early to, uh, 20th century. It was the turn of the century, you have a woman, a black woman writing operettas in Rio. Now you ask me, do, do we learn about Chiquinha Gonzaga at the Brazilian universities? No, we don't, for many reasons that we know. So um, now I think the, the, the problem with Nepomuceno is that the identity issue is very complicated with him because he's Brazilian, but he cannot be easily identified as a nationalist, you know. So for him, I think the journey is a little harder, you know, because uh, people say, oh, this is Chosson. Oh, this is Brahms, or, you know, so it's never himself. And he was just trying to be as genuine as he could, I think, you know. Do you think that that legitimizes his music more or less, or does it not have any effect in a way? The fluidity? Yeah. In my opinion, yes. In my opinion, that's the most important thing of, of Nepomuceno's music, is the ability of, um, of deciding what he wanted to be, how he wanted to express. You know, it's very hard these days. We have a uh, certain points of view, you know, we want to be seen as this or that. And back then, I think people also, people were like that, but then you have someone who was, for some reason, uh, he was in contact with many cultures, he had uh, contact with different contexts in his life, and why not to write in all of these languages, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of an assertion, musically speaking, that music, I mean, we have this lip service that we pay to this idea that music is a universal language and it's for everybody. But when you're a singer or you're a pianist who works with singers or someone who works with singers regularly, you can't, or when you're a composer, that kind of, you know, it doesn't always hold up. And his, his work kind of seems like an assertion that yes, it can yeah. be for everybody and you can, yeah. I, I can express myself as a human being full stop as opposed to a Brazilian or, you know, a, a new worlder or whatever, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I'm more than the, th the sum of my parts kind of a thing. Yeah. It's very inspiring. I think so. Yeah, I think that's the beauty, the beauty of his, um, uh, his music of his, uh, what he left to us. It's, the possibility of us choosing what kind of thing we want to do, you know. Right. I love that word fluidity. I mean, because we use it now, at least in, in the States, when we're talking about gender and we're talking yeah. about yeah. all of these things where we think, oh, you know, there must be a box in which people fit into and you are in that box and you are defined by that box. But, you know, obviously we've all are learning that that is BS and life and humanity are way more complex than that. Yeah. It's amazing that there was someone, I mean, was he aware of this, do you think back then? Or was he just doing his thing? We don't have much information of what he thought of his music because he was seen more as a professor. Even, um, you know, there was one interesting thing. There is actually uh, Arthur Rubinstein's The Early Years, it's called, I think, it, the first biography he wrote. He talks a lot about uh, his tours in South America. That was, you know, in the um, maybe around uh, 12, 13, I'm not sure, it's very early. And then uh, he mentions that he met two theory teachers in Brazil, Nepomuceno and Henrique also, who was about. He never acknowledged Nepomuceno as a composer. And there is one um, excerpt that he says, that Pupoceno was kind of jealous of Villalobos because uh, Rubinstein was Villalobos' friend. So he already was biased a little bit, you know, and he had, he was seeing Nepomuceno as someone like a strict professor from the university. But hello, this person was born in 1864. 
by 1920, he was kind of already, you know, someone of a certain age, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think uh, people were not aware of that. He, they, he was seen as someone who was in the 20s, let's put it this way, someone very old fashioned. Interesting. Yeah. And in because a way, he was forward, more forward thinking than any of them. Yeah. And it's funny, I mean, history doesn't always look kindly on what Villalobos did. In some ways, some people question mm -hmm. if it was appropriation and you know, mm -hmm. a sort of whitewashing of what actual indigenous music was. Of it, course. Yeah. I mean, come on. And Villalobos was so, uh, it's very, I mean, I think at one point people would look more at Villalobos music. I think people in Brazil are not so preoccupied with his music now, nowadays. I think there are other topics that are, you know, are being more attractive because it's so problematic. Villa Lobos himself called, uh, he called himself um, a white indigenous. Oh my God, this you is... never get away with saying that here. <laughs> not, I mean, not nowadays, not yeah. even here. Yeah. But that's how, how he called himself. And he made the trips, you know, to the, the rivers and the Amazon and all that. And he was just following the same pattern that French, Dutch people did in the 16th century, that they would go and, you know, uh, notate the music and everything. It was the same, the same idea. This kind of a, a exploitation, you know, appropriation. It's like robbery in a way, you know. I mean, and still, Nick, it's it's really ridiculous because still I see in Brazil. Well, recently, I saw this. Uh, one of Villa Lobos' major works is Shores Number no. Ten. It's for chorus and a huge orchestra. I think it was recorded in the states many times by New New World Symphony. It's a very nice recording. Yeah, my, and, that's right. It's a beautiful recording. It's got that picture of like a jungle and a parrot or something. Yes, yes. The, yes. the stereotypes are always there. No. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's a very nice recording, really nice. But recently, they did in the south of uh, southern state, southern part of the state of Bahia. Bahia is the state where the Portuguese first arrived. So that is the place where the whole thing started. Right. It's your so can you believe that this festival, it's like a music festival sponsored by L'Occitane. It is a place uh, in Tran Trancoso, uh, which is very fancy. It's a lot of international people come to have house. So they did Villa Lobo Churros Days and they put some indigenous uh, there to be part of this. It's totally different from, for example, what the Falia did in the operas that the opera stops and then you're going to have a real flamenco, you know, music. Right. That's totally different. So I think in the 20th century, we have better examples of what nationalism was. But Villa Lobos for sure was not. Well, I mean, in his defense, it was early and, you know. Yeah, it was early. But still, it's just, yeah. it's interesting, this conversation. We have a, we have a question from Shannon. She's chiming oh, in. Shannon. Hello, um, Shannon. Hi, Shannon. <laughs> She's asking, do you find that Nepomuceno's compositional style adjusts to or is affected by the language that he is setting? For sure, yes. Um, but again, he was not totally oriented by depicting specific things of the text, you know, but the overall form uh, or texture, it is related to the language. So for example, in the French music, you find more uh, of um, fluidity in the fluidity in the piano part. You know, more like equal values, more like lower register. Uh, in the German, sometimes you will have like recitatives or trumpet music. You know, more orchestral sounds. So again, the references are there. Now, it's not only the reference of what the, the, the text is saying, but the cultural background of that language, it's always present. I, I cannot say anything about Swedish because I'm not say, I can't say if there is any particularly, uh, something particularly Swedish in the, in the piece. But for sure, we can see how it, it changed. But it's never um, super specific. It's never like, oh, this is Schumann or this is Schubert. You cannot really 
understand what what's going on and this i think is originality this yeah. is something that's original it's the thing that makes him his even though it's yeah he's a chameleon yeah interesting so um again if anybody else has any questions on facebook please ask them in the comments and while i give you a second if you have any final questions as we start to wrap up i always ask people these last two questions all of our guests so okay. sorry <laughs> In advance. So, um, you know, what, the two questions, I mean, were CAIC is devoted to the art of the vocal recital and the art of song and vocal chamber music. And so I always wonder from our guests, how do you see the future of the vocal recital going forward from here? That's, that's the first question of the two. And then I have another one after you give that answer. Okay. Well, I think we've talked a little bit about this, but in Brazil, it's particularly difficult to, to attract audience for, um, I would say, for a class, uh, traditional configuration of a uh, voice recital. Uh, sometimes when there are big names that come, yes, it will be, you know, if Joyce Cidonato comes, it's going to be crowded and the whole Sala São Paulo will be full. But it's different. It, it, was a vo it's, it is a voice recital, but it's a different thing. Now, about four years ago, I started a series, a very small series of only voice recitals, and it was very hard to maintain. After that, I was invited by some institutions to sort of uh, think about different ways of putting this kind of repertoire. So I did a couple of productions with uh, dance. So I did a Schumann program, it was very long with Liste Liebe and other songs and duets and quartets, two choreographies, and they worked really well. And we've done this for two years. The first year was like uh, 1,500 people came in three days. And the second year again. So in two years, I got to show to 3,000 people what Schumann could be with dance. And then I got really enthusiastic about this kind of what can I do differently? So I'm more concerned of different ways of programming the music, you know? So the future of, that I'm doing is like a series of um, recitals with, uh, based on women composers, but not only. So I'm doing a recital, which is sort of a biogra musical biography of Pauline Viardot. So it's not only song, there is some of the, the arias that she sang, she sang, also some of her music. So I've been trying, I've been trying to do uh, the song in relation to other things. That's what I can tell you. Because okay. I, I gave up the other way in my country. I mean, no, that's part of what we try and do here too, with, especially with our festival. I mean, it makes sense to kind of, the song has to be tied to other things in a way, because otherwise, how do you underline its relevance to now? Yeah. Which leads me to my next question. By the way, um, La Laquita is um, sending you lots of love in the comments. Laquita, I miss you so much. I know, right? I know. Um, so my final question for you is, uh, why is song important? Why is song is important? You know what? I think for me, language is important. Speaking is important. important. And you know, uh, I think somehow we learn uh, the poems from reading it, you know, silently. And, and I think the songs are the way, the best way, I think, to have a body to this, to this text that otherwise would be only printed or only would be silently uh, pronounced in your ears, you know. So I really see the song as sort of a personification of a text, you know, like it, it's like uh, the text needs a body. It's not only music. It needs a body to pronounce it, to make that uh, particularly express it. So I think this will never end. Sometimes we will have to have someone dance, in with, dance with this song, but maybe not. But this embodiment, you know, of the language is for me the most important thing. And one of the challenges too, because if you do this to audience that are not, you know, 
they don't know the text, that what it means and how it works, it's hard to, but I think this is the challenge and the beauty, you know, together. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for my pleasure the time to be here with us today. Um, I'm just going to close this out really quickly. Um, Facebook, thank you for tuning in. <laughs> um, if, as always, if you would like to support these uh, broadcasts, uh, you can do so. There's a link somewhere in the comments um, where you can make a donation if you'd like to support these season broadcasts at CAIC. And um, we're going to be back next Thursday uh, with Shannon McGinnis, uh, one of our co-founders at CAIC, the pianist and our director of education, and also our vocal chamber music fellow, uh, Anna Lorenzo, uh, who um, is going to be giving a our next Leader Lounge recital uh, with Shannon. The Leader Lounge recital is broadcasting on April 30th, and uh, we'll be back here next Thursday at the same time, April 22nd, to do a little preview interview with them. But in the meantime, Thank you so much for being here, Ricardo. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful job that you're doing. I keep following you, uh, everything you're doing, all of this, uh, the seasons. Congratulations on that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being a part of our season. And uh, Facebook, we will um, we'll see you in a week. Take care, everybody.